Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Jacqueline Cordova Arrington, Assistant Professor of Flute in the School of Music and Dance at the University of Oregon. Prior to coming to the U of O in 2018, Cordova Arrington was a 2014-2016 fellow at Carnegie Hall's Ensemble Connect. And she was a 2010-2011 Fulbright Grant re recipient, the first American to study extensively with principal flutists of the Berlin Philharmonic. Cordova Arrington performs with the University of Oregon Woodwind Quintet and is principal flute with Orchestra Next. She recently performed with Chamber Music Amici at the Wildish Theater in Springfield. Thanks, Jackie, for coming on the show. Thanks so much for the invitation. So tell us about your background and what led to your interest in flute performance. Sure. Um, so I am originally from Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is a city that walks, lives, and breathes music, really a city of cultural renaissance. And, and so I really feel like I grew up in a culture of music appreciators and a community of music, music appreciators. Um, I have played piano for as long as I can remember, um, but I was first drawn to the flute actually uh, my dad is an avid music appreciator and mm -hmm. he's an amateur singer mm -hmm. and when he picked me up one day from school he surprised me with a CD um, of uh, William Bennett who's a British flute player and the CD's title was Romance <laughs> and, <laughs> and I remember he was you know sort of carting me off to my usual lessons post school and he said hey I got this new CD you know it's of this flutist you want to check it out so we listened to it in the car, and I immediately fell in love um, with the flute. I think there's something so unique about the flute, uh, the timbral aspects of sound, mm. all of the possibilities in color. And uh, for me, when I listened to that CD, the flute sounded so vocal to me. And, um, and I just feel like I've always felt, even as a young child, that vocal music has in has an incredible um, communicative power mm -hmm. and so I felt that with the flute as well and so that's kind of what drew me to mm -hmm. the instrument. Fascinating. So you, you got your Masters of Music and then you made a decision that not all performers make which is to get a doctorate of musical arts. What, what compelled you to do that? Why did you want to do that? Oh, I wanted more debt. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. No, 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 no that's kidding. not what compelled but, you to do But no, actually um, what compelled me honestly uh, prior to getting my doctorate, um, I was in Berlin um, doing a Fulbright with members of the Berlin Philharmonic. And while I was there, um, I was heavily involved um, in music performance, orchestral training, mm -hmm. and working with a community engagement uh, program. Uh, but something that I noticed that was really fascinating to me was that I realized that all of my teachers, um, until that point were not only fantastic performers but were amazing teachers <laughs> and I wondered what they had what ability they had to be able to um, give diagnosis to what students couldn't do mm -hmm. and I was really curious about this um, but didn't feel I was a really great teacher and so when I did my Fulbright I had deferred uh, from the Eastman School of Music for my doctorate I had a short stint of playing in the LA Phil on a trial, and after that post, um, I decided that I was going to go to the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, to get my doctorate because I wanted to uncover this ability to help students um, through experience, you know. And I felt like that's what a lot, you know, what my teachers did. So, hmm. so you, you mentioned your time in uh, Berlin uh, on the Fulbright. Um, you've said some of what was important sure. about that experience. Was there anything else about that experience that you want to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So after my master's, I had basically decided that I had just begun to sort of scratch the surface of being job ready. Mm. I didn't really feel, um, I felt like I had practiced, but I didn't feel adequately prepared to win a job right out you know, out of uh, my master's. Uh, usually in orchestras, there are two or three positions open um, and it can be highly competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not 
sometimes in a given year, they may, there may be only one or two positions open. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how good you have to be yeah. to win. Um, so I decided I wanted some time to hone in on my craft, but I also realized that school wasn't the option that I wanted at that time. And so one of my teachers suggested, well, why don't you apply for a Fulbright? And you know, I said, okay, maybe, you know, where am I gonna go? What am I gonna do? And I started thinking about my favorite orchestras, my mm. favorite players, and also places that um, had similar vision for uh, community engagement synthesis with music performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I found that the Berlin Philharmonic was a perfect model mm. for this. Mm. Um, and so it's very funny, uh, on a whim, I emailed my favorite flutist at mm. the time, Emmanuel Paoud, <laughs> And Good for you. to my surprise, he <laughs> answered me. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I can't teach you full time, but I have a colleague, Andreas Blau, who's the other co-principal, hmm. who could teach you regularly. And when you come, if you get this Fulbright, you can come and take some lessons with me too. And so one thing led to the next, and I found myself in Berlin. Um, so the first American ever. That's <laughs> such a wild accomplishment. Was, well, I don't know. <laughs> it, was really, it was a really fantastic experience for me. Um, just, I mean, being able to be around so much excellence, mm -hmm. rich tradition of rich traditions of orchestral playing mm -hmm. but then also to really witness um, mus musicians that were quite passionate and who are remain you know quite passionate about um, you know the community's role in music performance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in engagement and I had the opportunity to intern while doing my Fulbright with Zukunft at Beefy Phil mm -hmm. which is the education department mm -hmm. that's there and so I got to see musicians in new leadership roles crafting and creating projects and that was something that seemed really interesting to me so that's what I did there. So once you're um, you've completed the the uh, doctorate you um, became a fellow in Carnegie Hall's Ensemble Connect program which I know uh, engages these questions of community engagement as mm -hmm. well so tell us a little bit about that program first of all. Mm -hmm. So, so basically Ensemble Connect is a performing and teaching artistry fellowship uh, based in New York City. They are Carnegie Hall's resident chamber music ensemble. And they give um, recitals and concerts in traditional spaces like the Weill Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall, but also in more unconventional spaces like in, in prisons, schools, um, community centers, and things like that. Um, I was first really drawn to Ensemble Connect because I was studying for my doctorate and I realized that I hadn't really tapped into uh, chamber music as a profession. Mm -hmm. I had kind of done everything else, like, you know, I did orchestra very seriously. I d I've had some really fantastic solo performances with orchestras as a soloist, but I, I never realized um, you know, the capacity for chamber music to be a profession in and of itself, but mm -hmm. I knew of colleagues who had done it. So I applied for that fellowship and got into it and sort of working in the community and the rich experiences that they, that that organization does with community engagement was, was a byproduct of that. Um, for my first time, I, d I did a, a performance in a prison. I had never been in a prison before and it was just, I have to say, to this day, um, one of the most memorable experiences that I've had, mm -hmm. and I've kind of have been hooked um, since to working with different um, communities and in different spaces, because I realize that um, that it's one thing for music to exist as you know performance art; it's another thing for it to be a living, breathing organism in the community that inspires people to think creatively. And that's what I really gained with that group um, and with my colleagues there. And I still go back to New York and have good connection with Carnegie Hall and um, am so thankful to have built the, those connections there. So we're gonna take a, a brief pause and uh, show a clip of you playing as when you were there. Uh, this is a performance that was at Skidmore College. Yes. And we'll come back in a minute. Okay.
So um, you are a, a musician of color. Mm -hmm. And I know there are many, many young people of color who are interested in playing and active in playing classical music. But I, I, my sense is that um, there are institutional and structural barriers that discourage uh, uh, young musicians of color from um, entering this profession. Can you give us your opinion on ways in which institutions uh, might make it easier for uh, students of color to navigate the realities of these, of you know, music schools, orchestras, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, so this is such a great question. You know, for me, when I think back to when I was a student, I really didn't differentiate between genres of music mm -hmm. that I listened to. I just liked music, um, whether it was classical or bluegrass or gospel or whatever it was. I think what people process when they're listening to, um, to music is just the experience of, of art, mm -hmm. of, her, of, of beautiful experience. And, um, and so one of the ways I, I think that um, we can sort of break some of these barriers is by creating roles in higher institutions for people of color um, so that from a top-down approach that um, young people of color see themselves in the field of the arts. Um, I think that's, that's one way. Um, I think another way is to maybe dismantle some of the social standards of classical music performance. So why not have, you know, um, a particular orchestra play in outside of their hall space mm -hmm. and in a community center mm -hmm. or something like that, mm -hmm. um, bringing music to people rather than having people come to music. Um, but, you know, I think, I think lastly, I think the biggest component is that as um, classical music as an art form, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that every person that comes to a concert has a valued perspective and experience to bring. And sometimes um, that can be translated into programming works by musicians of color, by women. Um, but sometimes it can also just start with changing the tone of communication with audiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that for a very long time, classical music has sort of had this um, kind of high art mm -hmm. kind of image. And, and I don't think that we go to, at least I don't, go to a, a concert to experience high art. I go to a, a concert to, to have an experience. And that's something that everyone can share in and also reciprocate in. You know, so I love interactive performances. It's a mm -hmm. big part of what I did in New York and a lot of what I do here. Finding ways to engage um, audience members and their perspectives in a performance, that being just as critical as the performance in and of itself, I think is, um, is a huge step in the right direction to help people of color color navigate this space. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So you've, you've already sort of started to talk about this, but what attracted you to become a professor in higher education? In particular, what attracted you to the University of Oregon? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I mean, as you can tell by my career trajectory, it's been kind of diverse mm -hmm. and, you know, um, widespread. And I think, you know, for a long time, I've been looking for the right fit you know, mm -hmm. uh, for at first it was all I wanted to do was play an orchestra. You know, that's it. You know, you could not convince me of doing anything else. Um, and then, you know, all I wanted to do was chamber music. You could not convince <laughs> me of anything else. But I realized that working in an academic setting could really give me the platform to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, I sub with the Oregon Symphony. I sub with the Eugene Symphony. I'm able to build projects here with chamber groups like Chamber Music Amici and in, you know, New York. I'm also pursuing my own projects here independently um, and my own research. But then I have this incredible s studio of students that I get to share my experience with and help them sort of navigate 
um, their own career trajectories. So I really saw an academic position as, um, as sort of the perfect platform to explore all of the things that I was really interested in and to have that be valued. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of cases, um, you know, if you're an orchestral musician, you can, you can have a solo career, but it's a pretty tough career to have yourself spread really thin, mm -hmm. you know? But I felt like, you know, um, an academic teaching position has really given me the freedom to do that. And um, yeah, and I guess what drew me to the University of Oregon, I have to be honest, is that the School of Music felt like um, a very open, and still is, it's a very open and warm community of like incredibly creative people. And um, the School of Music is, felt like a blank canvas for me, like a bit. You know, some institutions are not. Mm -hmm. But I really felt when I interviewed for this position that there, and I still feel that there's a great deal of freedom, and not just freedom, but vision um, for the school, mm -hmm. especially with um, our dean, Sabrina Madison Cannon, who's incredible. Um, and I just, I love vision. And um, I'm really excited about places that have open vision to, to the future, you know, and ways that we can impact audiences and communities more with what we do in music. Mm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the things you do at the University of Oregon. So tell us about the Oregon Wind Quintet. Sure. So I have incredible colleagues. Um, so there are five members of the University of Oregon Woodwind Quintet, and it includes myself, uh, Steve Vaki, who's the professor of bassoon, mm -hmm. Melissa Pena, professor of oboe, uh, Juan Kim, professor of clarinet, and Lydia Van Driel, professor of French horn. Right now, Steve is on sabbatical, mm -hmm. and we have he has a wonderful uh, replacement, Nate Hegelson, who's come in to play bassoon. Um, but our quintet does several performances throughout the year, um, both locally, nationally, and now internationally. Um, so I guess it was prior to my arriving, the quintet had just come um, off of tour in Korea. Mm. So they were in Korea on tour. Um, and we are next week we're going to Dallas, Lebanon, and Salem to work with some local high schools and mm -hmm. to give performances. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year, we're engaging on a residency uh, with the University of Hawaii hmm. um, because we have a very strong and robust alumni network hmm. out in Honolulu. Hmm. So we're really thrilled about the projects and things that we have upcoming. Um, but it's a very active group. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for my colleagues. All of them are very busy, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and that's very common at the School of Music and Dance, that our faculty are just very distinguished, busy professionals, so it's great. So you're also the principal flutist for Orchestra Next. Yes. <laughs> so what is Orchestra Next? Tell us about that. Sure, sure, sure. So um, Orchestra Next is an ensemble that supports young emerging professionals. It's directed by Brian McWhorter. Um, and basically the ensemble gives several performances a, a year um, in collaboration with the Eugene Ballet. Uh, prior to Orchestra Next, the Eugene Ballet did not have live um, music. And Brian um, had this great idea. Well, we have wonderful musicians, faculty, and you know an incredible student body, and I'm sure we could draw even more students nationally um, to come, mm -hmm. you know, and play. And so essentially, it's a side-by-side -side orchestra for faculty and young professionals. Um, and I just think it's incredible. Uh, because I think back to my early experiences, and I remember growing up in Philadelphia doing side-by-side -side performances with the Philadelphia Orchestra, mm -hmm. and really feeling like I had ownership of my art that way, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. really felt like I wanted to pursue music because of that, getting tips and tricks from members of the orchestra. Um, and so I love um, being in a mentorship role, you know, it's mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that's really, um, important to my identity as an educator, and so I'm really thrilled that I have the opportunity to do that in Orchestra Next. So you, um, you've you just raised your, uh, the, the uh, image of yourself as an educator. It's very clear that you're an educator. Um, tell us a bit about how you approach flute pedagogy. Right. Okay, so my studio is very diverse. I teach majors. I also teach non-majors. Um, 
and any given term I can have between uh, 16 to 21 or 22 students that I teach individually. Wow. Last term was my largest um, studio class of 20, 21 students, mm. and now we're at about 16, mm. which is a com more comfortable number <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, but um, what I love about the University of Oregon is that I have this opportunity to work with students of diverse interests, you know, in music, <laughs> and I have students that are gonna go on to pursue um, you know, a variety of career paths in music, whether that would be performing with an orchestra or being an arts administrator, mm -hmm. or, you know, I even have a computer science major who's an excellent flutist, um, <laughs> you know, but I think uh, what's really critical and key to my teaching is that I maintain a very high standard of excellence for <laughs> fundamental playing. <laughs> I feel that when students have fundamental um, techniques for tone and for technical expression that, you know, the, with those tools you can do absolutely anything. And so while certainly I adjust my curriculum based off of the academic loads of my students, I try to maintain that standard of excellence because I know that's what's going to carry my students the farthest. Um, and I think that with that, I also teach my students um, to the best of my ability to be excellent at whatever you do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that even if, you know, flute is not your main gig, you know, you can still be excellent in it, you know, and that I, I think that that's, that's what I try the, to the best of my ability to teach. Do the, the um, profs in the music school per, um, recruit uh, musicians? Yes. Oh, so tell us about that part of your job. Yes. So I have to say that word recruitment <laughs> is a is a is one that's used a lot. But I prefer to look at it as um, as like, you know, what are the various ways that we're connected mm -hmm. in the community or mm -hmm. draw visibility mm -hmm. to what we do? So some of the ways that we do that at the School of Music is obviously through performance. So by performing locally, uh, by performing nationally and internationally, I think that that is a great way to bring greater visibility to the School of Music. So um, last year I did a, um, a wonderful residency at the Conservatory in Puerto Rico hmm. and that brought visibility. Students that had not really heard of the University mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. Oregon, now it's on you know their radar and they're very interested. Um, you know, performing locally. I performed just this last fall for the Greater Portland Flute Society and got a chance to connect with community of flutists um, there and obviously internationally whenever we do things like, you know, in performance. I think another way um, that has been really actually fantastic for me, a fantastic for, way for me to connect with the community has been in working with the Oregon Music Educators Association. Mm -hmm. So I recently did a coaching of a flute sectional mm -hmm. uh, for the OMEA conference that was held here in Eugene mm -hmm. and got to meet a lot of new students. So yeah, those are just a few of the different ways, basically through performance and education, um, you know, engagement efforts. So um, tell us what uh, music professors like you do, what do you do in the summer? Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, well, relax, no, <laughs> so, no, um, so actually, so in the summer, um, I generally teach at, you know, a music festival or perform at a music festival, so this upcoming summer, um, I'll be performing um, and teaching a little bit at the Vivo Music Festival in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll also be in Dallas, uh, Texas for uh, the National Flute Association's Flute Conference. Um, and so generally musicians are continue their work into the summer mm -hmm. playing and everything like that and you know performing in master classes and presenting master classes. So we just have a couple of minutes left. This may be my last question. I might have two more, but who are some of the contemporary composers and flutists you admire and enjoy and would recommend to our viewers? Sure. Um, so contemporary composers. Um, so a contemporary composer that I'm really into nowadays, her name is Allison Luggins Hall, and she is a member of Flutronics. It's a flute duo um, based in New York City with Natalie Joachim 
uh, who's a Grammy nominated um, flutist and composer. But Allison, both Allison and Natalie are great um, composers, but what really draws me to Allison's work um, is her interest in social justice mm -hmm. and having some of those themes come out in her music. Um, so she recently wrote a piece for solo piece uh, for solo flute called Homeland, and mm. it's all about some of the immigration issues that have been going on in our country. And um, another person that I am a huge fan of is Meredith Monk. Um, Meredith Monk um, is an incredible for performing artist, and in fact, she is going to be our Trotter um, fellow next year in February, our guest at the University of Oregon. And I just love the amount of risk that uh, Ms. Monk takes. Um, she's 78 and continues to take risks in her music making, and I wish to be like that, you know, um, through my career. And you've had the opportunity to perform with her? Yes, yeah. yeah. So we actually, Ensemble Connect uh, premiered her first piece that she wrote for Chamber Music Ensemble you're not familiar a lot with her work she writes primarily for vocalists mm -hmm. and so this was the first time she had written for chamber music for an instrumental ensemble and so we'll be bringing that piece back here to the university of oregon in its second performance so it's a it's going to be a really special event when she comes on campus and i hope that everyone will will come and join us well let's uh, tell everyone to do that please come and see meredith monk when she comes Jackie, I want to thank you so much for thank taking you. the time to speak with us today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Uh, you've been, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we've been speaking with Jacqueline Cordova Arrington, Assistant Professor of Flute at the School of Music and Dance at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.